thank you for attending our, what is our first seminar, uh, seminar of the year. Our talk this morning is about balancing delay analysis, which is the field I work in. Um, a few comments before the talk, don't send, me, don't send us to sleep. So hopefully you'll find it of interest. It's an interesting topic to me. Um, and if you're contractors in the room or solicitors, you might also find it of interest too. So what I'm going to go through is um, to pose some questions about delay to projects. Where are we as an industry? What are the crucial things affecting the industry at the moment? And that will come at the end of the talk. But to get there, I just want to firstly give a brief overview of how we've got to where we are uh, in terms of delay analysis and delays on construction projects. It's been quite an interesting uh, change in the viewpoint over the years of people's perceptions of how we go about analysing delay. So I'll start by just posing the question, what's the problem with delay analysis? Why does it get such a bad press within the field of construction law? I will then um, give a brief overview of the critical path method, which is crucial to understanding delay analysis, how that evolved and where it took us. I'll then cover um, a document called the Society of Construction Law Delay and Destruction Protocol, widely uh, talked about in the industry widely referred to. First edition 2002 and the last edition in 2017. So a 15-year gap and a lot has changed since the first edition to the second. And then we'll look at some future trends that are emerging in terms of delay to projects and how it affects uh, anyone involved in construction projects. Firstly then, let's pose the problem. What is the issue with delay analysis typically? Well, it's been highly criticised as a field of construction law in many papers. Many people talk of it as uh, a form of analysis which people don't understand, which is very theoretical and in many cases driven by what the programming software says. And some of the negative terms you'll see in some of the widely read papers are as such. Black box analysis, voodoo analysis, rubbish in, rubbish out, commonly used. Another one is the dark arts. People don't understand it. People don't get what delay analysis is all about. I found this image on the right on the internet, I think it perfectly sums up this problem, where essentially delay analysis about two things, the information being right, the contemporaneous records on the project. If those are poor, you can apply that to a really good method of delay, your results will equally be poor. Similarly, if you've got the best contemporaneous records of all the delays on the project, everything that's occurred on a daily basis, and you apply that to the wrong method of delay, equally, the results will be poor. And it won't stand up to scrutiny by the opposing side or a third party tribunal. So that's really the dilemma, is getting the information right and getting the model, the method that you're adopting right. And there's different methods of delay, and we'll come on to those um, in a moment. So that's the issue. General trend of people um, having a problem with what delay analysts do because of this issue of information and, and method. I'll try and show how we overcome that in the coming slides. Just going back though in time to, you know, what, where did delay analysis first arise from? Well, it really goes back to something called the critical path method. This is crucial to understanding delays in a project. So not every day on a job causes a delay to the end date. It has to be a critical delay. So as long ago as 70 years ago in the 50s, DuPont Chemicals and Remington Rand, two American businesses were trying to look at delays on their projects in the chemical world and how they can overcome that. And they developed this concept of the critical path method. Now, this revolutionized the way we manage projects. Um, and the, the def one of many definitions is as follows. And I quite like this one. The critical path method is the critical activities that represents the longest path through a project. And this determines the shortest possible duration. So any delay on that longest path, because it's the shortest duration achievable for a project, will cause delay to the end date. So the concept arose quite some time ago in the 50s. Delay analysis as a field, though, didn't really take off until many decades later. So we get to the 80s and the 90s. Computer software is um, becoming mainstream. People like Primavera were established, who are the market leader in terms of project planning software. They probably have 90% of the global market for infrastructure works. This then allowed the delay analysts or the planners on site claims consultants um, in the office to start modeling delays. Complex interactions of activities on the project, hundreds of thousands of activities, and the interrelationship between those activities to determine which are critical at any point in time and which are. 
Hence, the critical path method was adopted and it became mainstream. This was the start, really, of delay analysis as a field. And it took off in the, eight, in the 90s and 2000s in particular. As many case, as much, quite a bit of case law at the time, all pointing towards um, adopting a critical path method for analyzing delays. The courts are saying, look, you need to look at the impact of the events on the plan program. You need to look at the critical path initially and during the course of the works and so forth. And this other case here from 2002, crucial question, is the delay on the critical path? So the industry is adopting this approach that you have to look at delays from a critical path point of view. Not every delay is going to cause delays to the project. Not every delay entitles you to an extension of time and or money. So this approach to the critical path method gained its high point in this document, the Society of Construction Law Delay and Structure Protocol. It was quite revolutionary back in 2002 when I was starting out. And it really gave some guidance or practice on how we should adopt delay analysis as an industry. And it had some quite um, specific requirements for how you should go about analyzing delay on a project. And it said you should do a critical path method at any given time, even when the works are finished. So during the works and after the works. And it advocated a method of delay called time impact analysis, which is one of the model methods that quite relies quite heavily on the computer to help generate the answer to what the delay is during the works. Interestingly, it also recommended that the tribunal, whether that's an adjudicator or an arbitrator or a judge, the person analyzing the claim, to put themselves back in the position of the contract administrator at the time the event arose. So looking at it on a perspective basis, what would the effect of the delay be at that point in time? Now this, this concept uh, was, was called into question later on in that what the first edition was advocating was a method that perhaps conflicted with what the facts of what actually occurred on the project. And you'll see how the second edition of this document that came out 15 years later has resolved that and has uh, advocated a different approach to analyzing delay. Before we look at that second uh, edition, just want to cover a couple of key concepts in terms of delay analysis, because they're really crucial to understanding um, delay on a project. First one is what I call the timing of the analysis. So this is basically, you know, essentially put yourself at time now, the hash line. If during the works, the end date isn't known, it hasn't materialized yet, it's in the future. You can undertake what we call a perspective analysis. So it's forward looking. It calculates a theoretical entitlement because the end date isn't known. And as such, it relies on the critical path method. It relies on the software to assist you in looking at the remaining works on a planned basis of when you might finish. So it gives you a theoretical entitlement to an extension of time. However, when you finish the project, you can adopt a different approach, retrospective. You can look back at what's actually been incurred, what delays actually occurred during the works. You know your actual delay to the end date or sexual completion dates. And this form of method of analysis relies less on the computer, it's more of an as-built program, typically call it, and that is more a picture or a view of what occurred, rather than allowing the software to model the delays. The two different ways of looking at delay analysis. So within the, the two groupings of perspective and retrospective, there's different methods out there. They fall into the two camps. So during the works, you do some perspective, typically. Impact, impacted as planned or time impact analysis are the two main methods. Of the two, the one at the bottom is much better, it's fairer uh, than the impacted as planned. Retrospective typically rely more on an as-built form of delay analysis. A totally different way of looking at delay. Much more factual, much more con based on the contemporaneous evidence, rather than, than the perspective, which looks at your plan program that remains at any point in time. So two different ways of looking at delay. Now, obviously the first edition of the SCL protocol said, always do a perspective method, whatever circumstance you're in, even when the work's finished. And this caused a lot of discussion and debate within the industry about whether this is actually right. Does this actually conflict with English law? The principle that 
you can only gain your actual loss rather than some form of theoretical entitlement to time and or money. And some of the case law that developed since that first edition came out was very against what allowing the computer driven um, outcome, the planning software to demonstrate the delays. A couple of key cases um, in the mid 2000s are as follows. The Skanska Eggers is a big case about delay analysis. The judge said you should not be hidebound by theory when demonstrate facts applied with computer programming logic. So very much against the answer coming out of the computer model if the facts say something different. Similarly, Great Eastern Lang, another big uh, case that involved uh, analysis of delay, he said the impact of that part of method, which is a critical part of method, takes no account of the actual events and gives rise to a hypothetical answer. The courts are straying away from this approach of the computer and the software determining delay. Probably the best um, quote I've come across is as follows, which isn't from a case, but from a paper written on the subject by a gentleman called David Barry in 2009. And his, this was a QC, a leading barrister, it said to him, why look in the crystal ball when you can read the book? So the crystal ball there is the model, the software, generating you an answer to delay. The book is the as-built program showing you what actually occurred on that project. Obviously, QC's opinion is read the book, and I would agree with that, particularly when the works are finished in their entirety. So this came to a head, this, this debate between the prospective method and the retrospective method came to a head in 2017, when the SCL um, site construction law got together and issued a new draft of their delay instruction protocol, heavily revised from their first edition. They no longer prefer a critical path method in terms of in its entirety. They no longer prefer time input analysis, which is a prospective method of analyzing delay. They also state when you're time distant from the delay event, so when the works are finished and many months have gone by since the event arose, you, don't, you should not be doing a prospective analysis anymore. The total change from what it first advocated back in 2002. The 15 years gap between the two, the industry's taken a view on what's right in terms of delay analysis. A couple of interesting points. Um, this document has nine references to the term common sense first edition of two. So you can see the way they're looking at delay. It should be a common sense based approach. And also they say CPM, quick path method, is not limited to the use of specialist planning software. The delay analyst should be able to justify the critical path on the basis of the facts alone and the evidence that supports that and their own knowledge of construction methodology and activities. So general trend away from the computer giving the answer. And I agree wholeheartedly with what they're saying there. That's a brief overview of how delay analysis has ar arisen um, as a field of construction law, how the industry's moved from being program driven to fact based, I think. And how does that play out going forward then? Well, I guess this debate around perspective and retrospective methods of delay is still out there. And it's quite prevalent, I think, in relation to the NEC3 contract, because the NEC3 contract says its mechanism for analyzing time and uh, money, compensation events, is on a forward-looking basis. You agree at the time an estimate of the impact of the delay and of the money that's associated with that, rather than looking at the actual entitlement once the delay has arisen. That's how it works, the NEC. However, what we commonly find is that the parties, uh, both the contractor and the employer, typically don't always administer in this way. The question then arises, should you go back in time and look at delays on a prospective basis, which is what the first SCL protocol was saying, whereas the new one is saying you shouldn't do that. Well, on that point, a case came out um, last year in Northern Ireland, which I believe it's persuasive here, but not binding. Um, and the judge was talking about a conversation event and the cost of that conversation event. And should he go back in time uh, and assess it on a prospective estimate basis, even though that event had arisen. And the judge said, no, why should I grope in the dark when I know what's actually happened? My point being, that was related to money. Should the same apply to time? Should we, on an NEC contract, when it hasn't been administered and the impact of delays hasn't been assessed during the works, should we now 
do what the contract says, or should we um, do something on an as-built basis, which is totally not what the NEC is all about. Just a question, I think that's what we should be doing. The lawyers here may be able to give you a better answer than that. Um, but something to consider. So this retrospective perspective debate is still out there on how we analyse delays, particularly in relation to the NEC. Another issue that's been in hot debate for many a year in terms of construct, uh, delay analysis is concurrency. <coughs> now, concurrency, what do we mean by concurrency? Well, it's essentially it's two delay events occur at approximately the same time. So one's a contracted delay, one's an employer delay. Or, alternatively, one's a main contracted delay, and one's a subcontracted delay. Two delay events occur on the project at approximately the same time. A well-known definition here by um, a barrister QC, John Marin, he talks of a period of project overrun, so there's delay to the end date, caused by two or more events of approximate equal potency, equal effect on the end date. How does that relate to um, contracts then? Well, traditionally, the traditional view of concurrency, in, in my opinion, is as follows. We have an end date on a project, and we have two delay events occurring at approximately the same time. One's caused by the contractor, one's caused by the employer. Each on their own is having an effect on the end date. So, but for one of them, the other would cause delay to the end, to the end completion date. In that traditional view, you get an extension of time. You're not, as a contractor, liable for damages. Now, you're not necessarily going to get all your costs. That can be based on an apportionment type basis, but you would get all of your time. You wouldn't be liable for damages in that case. That's how I've always seen concurrency. Um, and I think the leading case on this is um, relates to a hotel by Piccadilly, the Malmaison Hotel, the case of Malmaison Henry Boot back in, I think it was 2000, where the judge said, look, you'll get your time um, where you have an effect of a delay concurrent with the other party. And I think that's a fair system that you don't get penalised. However, if you now look at what this, the SCL, the new protocol is saying, and its basis of the new protocol is what new case law is saying is a slightly different view, like going against the contractor, I believe. And what they say there is, if the employer delay doesn't move the already delayed completion date any further, no EOT is due. So what do we mean by that? Well, we have our contract completion date, we have a contracted delay, and that contracted delay is pushing out the end date. If, let's assume, hours or days, a few days later, an employer delay event arises that is shorter in duration than that other contract delay, so it's overlapping, but it's not as having as big an effect on the end date, in that case, that employer delay is not pushing out completion any further. And hence, under that view of concurrency, no extension time is given. So, general trend away from the contractor gaining his extension of time. In my view, somewhat unfair, because had it not been for that contractor delay, the employer delay would have caused delay at the end date. Because it's not pushing out the delay any further than it already was, so it's all about the effective cause on the end date, at the time it arose, no time is given. And you would as contractor be liable for damages. So a totally different view of how we deal with concurrency. It seems to be emerging if you read what the, the SCL protocol now says. And there's some case law around this recently. Um, so as contractors, I think it's something to be aware of. I think contractors need to be very mindful of their own um, concurrent delays. Um, plan your works to mitigate those delays. Uh, be aware of them because you may not be able to rely upon the employer delays to get an extension time going forward. Now, if you think that is quite bad for contractors, unfortunately, it gets slightly worse in terms of concurrency, because a big case came out last year called North Midland Sidon, which said, if there's a, an express term in the contract, it's where you've uh, agreed that any delays by the employer, which are concurrent with your own delays, you will get no extension time anyway. So this is really uh, sort of shaking the industry in some ways. And I see these clauses quite a lot when we get um, claims coming through at the moment. It seems to be used, before this case came out, it was quite prevalent. Um, and really it's something for traps to be very aware of. Uh, it makes my job a lot more difficult if this type of clause is in the contract, because any delays by the contractor themselves overlapping with employer delays potentially mean you get no time. You are still liable for damages. And that's what that case said. Um, what the case said was you can't allow the well-held well principle 
the French principle, which is a well-established principle that a party can't gain, the other party can't gain from their own breach. So general trend to me seems to be that concurrency is moving away from the contractors. It's making it harder for contractors to gain an extension of time. Um, somewhat fairly, I think, because it is only relief from damages an extension time gives you. Um, however, you know, it's just something to really be aware of in that regard. It's a hot topic at the moment. Just a couple of other points to conclude on. Um, this is how the delay world presents its claims. You know, volumes of, of programs, typically. Um, many activities, and I pose a question really, do third party tribunals, adjudicators, arbitrators, and judges really understand this level of detail? And that was made uh, clear to me when I chatted to an adjudicator recently at an event. And he said, if your program is over 20 pages, Tom, we as adjudicators will not understand it in the time we've got. So the question really is how do we, as a field of delay analysis, present our claims more coherently? Well, I guess we summarize them. We give them the overall headline view. But is there another way of doing things in terms of delay analysis? Well, I think there is. And we're seeing this going forward. So what seems to be coming into in play now is 4D visualization of delays. So obviously BIM is, is prevalent in the industry now. So we've got the BIM model, you, the software that links that to the schedule, the programs. It can allow you to 4D model delay events over time. So you can conceptualize it much easily uh, in a model. And that allows the tribunal or the other party to really understand your case. Um, from what I read on it to date, it's stronger evidence and it will lead to more successful outcome. So this is something we're, we're looking into at the moment. I think it will take off. I think it's more prevalent to uh, complex disputes because of the investment in this type of delay analysis. But I think it would definitely pay off in those circumstances. So the way we present claims is, is crucial going forward. And, and that will, will change, I think, in time. <coughs> Just one final point um, in terms of delay analysis is record keeping. Um, this quote, which Bill stole my, stole my quote earlier, uh, from Max Abramson, uh, the late Max Abramson, who sadly passed away last October, but I think this quote will, will live on beyond him for some time, which is, a party dispute will learn three lessons often too late, the importance of records, the importance of records, and the importance of records. Now, this is really important in, in terms of delay. Uh, when we are presented with a claim that's got good records, it's much easier to present a case. When the records are poor, it's much harder. Contractors generally don't keep good enough records. I think it's just not priced in at the tender stage, um, but it's crucial if there's a dispute. One advent uh, of what we're seeing changing is um, drone footage. So going back to what Paul discussed, we've seen it on a road project recently where the contractor is taking regular footage of what's occurring uh, on a weekly or, or monthly basis. This is a fantastic record at the end of the project of if there's delays of what occurred and when. Now, I recall probably about four or five years ago working on a power project, and all of this was done by helicopters at great expense to the contractor. Every month they'd go out and do this. Obviously, the cost has been driven down. It's much cheaper to price in for this type of record keeping, and it will probably pay dividends at the end of the project when there is a dispute and we have to analyze what's occurred. So particularly for large sites like roads, rail, power projects are very useful. Some of the best records I've seen on power projects is the aerial views of what occurred and when. There's certainly something to consider um, for the contractors out there. So just a brief recap of what we've gone through. We set the scene, the problem with delay analysis, why <coughs> people don't like it. You know, the model, the computer giving me the answer, no one understanding it. We chart the history of the critical path method being crucial to delay analysis. You can only claim delays against the critical path. That led to the rise of the SCL protocol in 2002. The criticism of that the return to common sense, the later addition that told you to do a much more fact-based analysis in 2017. And then we just posed some questions in relation to some trends moving forward. So this debate over how we analyze delay, particularly after the works are finished, perspective, retrospective. Concurrency, probably the biggest issue at the moment in terms of delay analysis, how that's dealt with. How we present claims in terms of 4D modeling and um, record keeping in terms of drone footage and such like, how the importance of that to, um, to present your case when there is delay at the end. So thank you for your time. That concludes. Um, <laughs>